ready to get into this message. So let's go ahead and start off with prayer. Lord, we thank you, God, for meeting with us already. God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence that is so real and so tangible. And God, I know that those that are in this room feel it, but I know, God, even those that are watching online right now, we pray for every living room. We pray for every kitchen. We pray for every bedroom. We pray for every car. Lord, wherever someone might find themselves listening to this message, God, we pray, Lord, that your presence would be there. And, Lord, we ask that you would meet women all across our region where they are. Because, God, we have come to the place that we know we need you like we've never needed you before. And so, Lord, we thank you that you are the answer. We thank you, God, that you are are our answer. You are our hope. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, over the past six months, I've been thinking just um, about the state that we find ourselves in. And, And the one thing that comes to my mind is how there is such a sense of hopelessness. There is such a sense of this loss of hope And if you look up the definition of hope, it's a feeling of expectation. It's a feeling of desire for a certain thing to happen. And you know, when I'm talking to people, there's no more expectations. There is no more desire because there's no more hope. I think about back to as many of you, maybe your spring break vacation canceled. As early back, remember Easter? Remember the funny memes back then? Like my Easter dress, maybe I'll go to dinner in the kitchen, and then I'll go to church in the living room. Yeah, that was funny back then. But it's six months later, those memes are not funny. They are not going around the internet anymore. You know what I mean? What about this? This was a heartbreak for me. Seeing weddings. I mean, brides that have dreamed about this day for their entire lives, have maybe planned about this from when they were a little girl, maybe a lot of money and deposits and planning, canceled. Here's another one that really got me over the last six months, graduations. Man, some of these kids have worked 12 years, have really put it in for 12 years and missed out on some important things. College graduations. I got to talk to a girl here who was going to be only the second person in her line of family for gener- like generations, like the second person to graduate from college and missed out on that opportunity. I thought about celebrations like baby showers or what about bridal showers or birthday parties. We've missed a lot in the last six months. What about summer vacations? A lot of us looked at the four walls of our homes. I mean, thank God we live at the beach, right? We are blessed. Many of you maybe have people that live in middle America, and they're probably like, don't talk to us. You live at the beach, right? And how about this one? Back to school And your kids are sitting in your living room right now, right? What about back to school shopping means everyone gets new pajamas. In fact, I think if you are in a school district that you are doing 100% virtual learning, you need to give yourself a big old pat on the back because I know you did not sign up for this. And if you're a teacher in the room, I think you need to give yourself like a back massage or something because I definitely know that when you chose your profession, this is not what you had in mind. Hopelessness. I also read that the definition could be a feeling of trust. And boy, aren't we feeling that. No trust. You know, I thought about 
we do live at the shore, and so many um, people, their businesses, the main part of their income is over the summer. And so many of us have seen the summer come, and we've seen the summer go, and we're thinking, where is the money going to come from for the rest of the year? I thought about this. We've always trusted our local and our national elected officials to make this giant empire called the United States who influences the entire world to keep businesses open, dining and entertainment establishments open, gyms, schools, museums, places open. I started thinking that even under incredible um, threats and wars, under the conditions that we lived in, under 9-11 and some bombings that we've seen, there has never been a time in our modern nation world that we have closed down because of a health crisis. I do know over 100 years ago, there was the great flu of 1917 and 1918, but our world looks much different now than it did then. You know, and I started thinking that many times the way that our country has come through crisis has been uniting together, but our country is now more divided than it has ever been when we need each other the most. Our country is divided over simple things like masks. I got so sick and tired of seeing fights in the grocery store about people saying that their mask should be over their nose that I decided, I think online grocery shopping sounds really good right now. But let's get more serious. Our country is divided over political parties, over elections right now. And something that I believe will go on beyond political parties and elections is the issue of racism. You know, in Proverbs 13, 12, it says, Hope delayed makes the heart sick, but desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Sarah Haggerty, in a book that she wrote called The Door, which happens to be one of my top five books I've read this summer, if you follow us on social media, she said this in her book, Hopelessness often gets masked behind idealism. I'll say this again, hopelessness often gets masked behind idealism. You see, I think that we all have an idea or idealism for our lives. Maybe it is the Hallmark movie Hope. Are you excited about Hallmark movies coming out or what? I mean, there's some, I know some of you are like year-rounders, but come on, the new ones should be popping up pretty soon. Or better, what about those daydreams as a child? Or maybe even what our culture has deemed as milestones. For example, at 18, you graduate uh, high school. 22, you graduate college. Then you need to get a job. And then you buy a house. And then you get married. And then you have kids and blah, blah, blah. What if we just, you know, those are the milestones. Those are the idealisms we have in our life. You know, I found some hilarious memes online. Um, production team, you might want to get ready for these, right? Of expectation versus reality. Have you ever seen some of these before? I'm sure you've seen them before. Um, so this is one that I heard. I thought it was so good. Like on um, Pinterest, it was supposed to come out like that. That was the expectation. There was the reality. All right, do we have another one? Right. Like that's the way you see yourself sleeping. That's really the reality. The super blood moon, what it was supposed to be versus what my camera sees. Anyone stayed up ridiculous hours of the night to see something and you're like, what am I looking at again? Right, another like Pinterest, it's supposed to look like that. Mine came out like that. Right, we all can relate, amen? We can all relate. This is the haircut, this is reality doesn't look the same. When I am trying to draw something, I imagine in my head, that is, that is Danielle for sure. Definitely. Yes. Um, I wrote this one because this is so real for Brendan and I. Using the person next to you as a pillow, but the reality is you're using the pillow next to you as a person, right? We all have these expectations. Um, I heard this quote one time, and I'm sure you've heard it before, that disappointment is the gap that exists between expectation 
and reality. All in between is where our disappointment comes from. See, the serious state of our country is that we've lost hope and we're disappointed. But I know that God's will for our lives is this in John 10.10, 10, that a thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but God has come so that we may have life and have it to the abundance. That's what I know. That's what I know that I know that I know. So I started thinking, what if, what if our hope is in all the wrong things? What if we have allowed the wrong things or people to anchor us as our security, as our identity, as our happiness, or what our hope should really be in? What if our hope has been in people and it's been in bosses, it's been in the government, it's been in money, it's been in job titles or, or how much pleasure we can consume? It's been in our homes or it's been in marriages, it's been in children, friendships, shopping, traveling, the list can go on. And when our hope is in those things, we feel very lost right now. Romans 8, 24 through 25 says this, but hope means that we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need to hope for something we already have? Verse 25 says, so because our hope is set on what yet is to be seen, we patiently Keep on waiting for its fulfillment. Yes, yes. So it made me start thinking about a painter. I hope that as you walked in, you got to see my very good friend Victoria out there painting a beautiful, beautiful canvas. Because I had this vision that when a painter looks at a blank canvas and has a vision for that canvas, No one knows what is in that painter's heart until it has been completely, fully completed. You know, she's out there just adding layers, but you're not going to know what the finished product is and what was in her heart for that painting until it's all done. What if the painting that you've envisioned for your life is not what God envisioned? What if you have placed your hopes in things that can collapse by the circumstantial winds of life? See, I think hopelessness can leave us feeling like we are staring at a blank canvas and the feeling of overwhelm of the vastness of unknowings. See, as much as I would like to tell you that I'm an artist, I am not a painter. If I had to stand out there and look at a blank canvas the size that she's painting and say, Danielle, make something that no one will laugh at, that would be overwhelming for me. But let me tell you the good news is that we are saved into a hope. That hope is that talks about in Romans 8, 24, 25, that it does not need perspective. It does not need dreaming. It does not need planning. It does not need vision. In fact, um, I could start with nothing and still receive his hope, the great artist hope for my life because he has a plan for my life that is greater and more beautiful and more intricate and the colors blend together and the shadows that I can't even conceive because I'm not made to paint on my own canvas. See, his hope thrives best when I actually start with nothing. See, in Raymond, Romans 8, 24 through 25 that we just read, I believe right now, September 2020, ground zero, if we want to call it that, just it's the beginning of everything, is the prime place for God to birth a right perspective of hope. A right perspective of hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. 
that means that you're expecting something. I can't, um, when I was reading about what the watchman would go through back in those times, um, there were times that, you know, they would have to keep their eyes peered open. They could not go to sleep on the job because the moment they would even think about going to sleep on the job could mean a security breach for the entire city. I want you to know, now's not the time to fall asleep on God. Now is not the time. We must keep looking and saying, God, show me. Show me what you're doing. Show me the glimmers of hope that is happening. It says, oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness. And with him is abundant redemption. That's what you're looking for. Whatever the enemy has taken from you, whatever has been stolen from you in the last six months, there is great abundant redemption. So the art of waiting. You know, our minds always see waiting as a punishment or an annoyance. No one likes waiting more than I do. But I started thinking about this. What if waiting on the Lord was never meant to be a punishment? But what if the waiting, what if right now, the waiting, the journey that you're in right now was better than your destination? Because in waiting, you linger longer in his presence. I don't know about you, but when I get desperate, I get a little bit more clingy to God. And the waiting was actually him calling you in, drawing you in closer to him because he wants you to get to know him better to go deeper in relationship with him. So what if, may I ask you to open up your mind for one minute with me. And if I was to tell you that the darkest night of your soul might be better than the journey, than the very thing that you're hoping in, because now could be the deepest and most richest and most intimate time you will really get to know Jesus. Like you've never gotten to know him before because you're more desperate to get to know him now than you ever would be when everything was going great for your expectation. See, our culture has been consumed with the need to have instant gratification. Everything we want or need at our fingertips, the very second we need it. We don't like to wait for anything. I think Amazon Prime is way too long. Two-day shipping? Are you kidding me? I like to see when I go on to Amazon Prime and they tell me it's going to be there tomorrow. I'm like, now that's what I'm talking about. That is prime. And back in COVID, that whole garbage about waiting a week or two weeks, oh, no. No, no. But sometimes, I know I'm guilty of this, when we pray, it can be our tendency to come with our list. I have one. I have a prayer journal. And just to plow through it as fast as possible so that we can get on to the rest of the things we want to do. And I think the way to have a real relationship with Jesus is to sit with him. To sit. I'm talking about praying. I'm talking about waiting until you know he's there with you. I'm talking about stopping until you know he's here. I'm talking about not stopping until you know he has heard the deep things of your heart. And girlfriend, that doesn't happen in a five-minute drive-through prayer. It's not giving up until you know that you have actually spent time with Jesus. 
And I know it can be hard. I know. You can get antsy. I know. I know. You have plans for the day that's trying to fill your minds. Oh, I know. In fact, I just decided, Satan, you are the best planner I have. Because when I sit down to have my prayer time and just say, God, I'm desperate. I need to spend time with you. Everything I forgot to write on my to-do list comes to my mind. So I'm like, thank you, Satan. I'll write that down. I'll get to that right after this. Anything else you want to bring to my mind? Anything else I forgot off the grocery list? Go ahead. Bring it down. It'll happen after this. But I keep a piece of paper right next to me because I know I'm going to think, that chicken I was supposed to put in the freezer um, that we didn't cook, it's been in there for four days now. Oh, my goodness. I better get up and do that. You know how I'm talking about. We get distracted. The devil will throw all kinds of things he knows at you because he knows that when we actually spend time in the presence of the Lord, our lives are changed. You cannot be in the presence of God and not have your life changed. It's impossible. We don't give them a chance. We want this drive-through meeting. We want it quick. We want it easy. We want something that won't take much of our time. And yet, we want everything. But can I tell you what God wants? He wants actual friendship with you. He wants to be your friends. And he wants you to be his friends. He has made it, to, he has made it so that this relationship takes real time. It takes real effort, just like any other friendship. I want to give you an illustration of what I mean. The, I, the worship team can come on up. But I inherited a rose garden at my house. And I need to tell you, I love roses. In fact, they are one of my favorite flowers. Um, we had roses in our wedding. Everybody had, I had a big giant rose bouquet. All the bridesmaids had rose bouquets. Um, they're just one of my favorite roses. But I have heard that they are a lot of work. So one day I looked at my rose garden that I inherited because I would have never planted a rose bush. And I thought, I'm going to have to take, I'm going to have to learn how to take care of these beauties because they're beautiful. And so I have to tell you, I've kind of like just let them go and do their thing and just kind of like did this, water them, throwing some fertilizer at them, come like, all right, babies, come on, just get bigger and bigger and bigger, you know? And, and they've bloomed for me and they have just been, oh man, they have shown off. I mean, big, beautiful, fragrant, uh, the colors, oh my gosh. Like, did you know that, that roses, the tips can be a different color than the inside? I mean, it is just gorgeous, gorgeous. God's amazing. But one day, finally, I had a moment to sit and watch some YouTube videos on how to take care of roses properly and how to prune them. And my heart sank. And I literally started feeling nauseous when I heard what I was going to have to do to these beautiful rose bushes. In fact, I want to read this to you because I don't even think I could describe this to you without like getting nauseous and telling you. Spring rose pruning is the time to get pretty severe with your cuts. Oh, you're not ready for this. Severe with your cuts. You can usually expect to prune about one third to one half of your rose bush or shrub. What? These things are bigger than I am. I am not a master pruner. It says actually to leave your rose bush about knee high. These things are, I want them big. Who is going to take it back? I'm like, that's their rose bush, not mine. Like, they can take theirs back, but mine's big. Like, okay, maybe I'll, like, take a little bit off. But no, it says this type of pruning will spur on new growth and encourage the production of spring blooms. I was actually watching these YouTube videos on a road trip 
And I looked at Brendan and I said to him, I don't know how I'm going to do this. It's going to look like I am killing these rose bushes. In fact, uh, media team, do you guys have, I need to show you these pictures um, because you need to understand. Yeah, okay. I, um, do you have another one up there too? Right, so like that's after in the winter, right, you know, obviously all the leaves, but do you see how big that is? And then can you go back to that other one? To show, do you see how far he's cutting down? That's it. They say actually just about four stems is all you need. But if I don't do this, I'm not gonna have beautiful roses the next year. And here's the other thing. My rose bush will start producing less and less flowers. See, John 15 says this. I am the true vine. Listen up, we're ending. And my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. But listen to this. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit. What? The branches that are beautiful? The branches that were, you were getting promoted six months ago. Your kids were getting services they needed. You were planning for the best vacation of your life. Things were going really well in your marriage. Things were finally going well with your kids. Things were going well with addiction recovery. There was fruit. But he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. Verse four says this, here is the secret though, remain. Or some versions say abide. Can you say that with me? Remain, remain, abide in me. And I, that friendship we were talking about in a minute ago, that friendship where God just wants you to linger in his presence because he wants to abide in you as well. This is not a one-sided friendship. This is a two-sided. He wants you to abide in him, but he wants to abide inside of you. It says just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you say it with me, remain in me. So I, as I was reading this, I thought about a story I had read. You guys, if you know me long enough, you know I am kind of like a fan of Joanna Gaines, like a major fan. And so I was reading her book and I wanted to tell you this story. They got married on May 31st, 2003. And it says they were to be married outside a historic home in Waco as the setting was a garden filled with beautiful white roses. And they didn't need much of a budget for wedding flowers, they write. But when they arrived for the rehearsal the day before their wedding, they discovered the estate had pruned all the roses. There was nothing but empty stems. Joanna writes this, the arbors, the arch over the altar, everything was just leaves and thorns. So it says that they scrambled to buy hundreds of white roses and stuck them in the bare bushes, trying to make them look as natural as possible. And so I thought of that story and I want to tell you this tonight. This is what I want to tell you. Your life might feel like everything you have worked so hard for has all diminished in six months. And maybe you walked in here tonight feeling so hopeless, like you're staring at a blank canvas again and thinking, I am not sure that I have the energy to pick up a paintbrush and to start painting from the very beginning again. Or maybe 
maybe you walked in here thinking just a few months ago, I was a big, beautiful, fluffy, flowering bush that everyone was admiring and couldn't get enough of. And now I am nothing but sticks sticking out of the ground, maybe 24 inches high. No one even cares about me anymore. There's nothing left to admire in my life. You have lost hope. But I am here to tell you that tonight he's the master pruner. And listen, in my hands, a pair of shears can be a weapon. But those same shears in the master pruner's hands is a tool that is working inside of your life to make you even more fruitful than you ever were before. So in Psalms, we're going to end with this. David used to praise the Lord. But every time I've noticed in a few of his chapters, he would admit, God, I'm scared. I'm afraid. In fact, I'd like to give it all up. But God, I put my trust in you. God, I put my hope in you. And so tonight, I want you to stand to your feet. And we are going to do, we're going to end and make some declarations just like David did. In Psalms 42, 11, he said, why, my soul, are you so dejected? Why are you in so much turmoil? Put your hope in God. Say it with me, for I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. He also said in Psalms 119, 114, could you say it with me? You are my shelter and my shield. 